Okay, now today, today, let me just tell you, you got to buckle up, you all, because this is going to be a challenging day. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians, we're in the midst of a sermon series called Change of Heart, and we're taking a look at this really challenging book, 1 Corinthians. And it's, it's just, it's a challenge, it's tough. I, wanna, I just want to let you all know that. Today, chapter 5 and chapter 6, so open your Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you've got a paper Bible, fine, go to it now. If you're on a device, you can go to the church app, Celebration Baptist Church's app. You can download that from your favorite app store. And then our church app has a Bible feature on it. You can find 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So go ahead and find it now, and then buckle up. It's going to be... It's going to be kind of a bumpy ride this morning, okay? You ready for the Bible to get in your face a little bit? Because that's what's going to happen today. Let's pray and then let's get started. Lord, we love you. We're grateful to be here. We're grateful to have the Word. We thank you for its honesty with us. We thank you for its integrity. We thank you for its truth. And we take up the challenge of saying, hey, the Bible tells me this is how I live. So we're going to take up the challenge to live that way. Give us that measure of boldness. And so we've got a few minutes together to look into your Word. Our time is going to go by really fast. So help us to pay attention. Help us to focus and concentrate and get the most out of these moments together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a lot of years ago, we were in the planning process of what we still call the new building. Okay, that's the building located between here and the gym. It's where the Broom Tree Cafe is, all the children's ministry area, the offices. Uh, There was a time when that building was not here. We desperately needed the space. And the timing of needing that building uh, was really challenging. So what was going on 2008? Do you all remember what happens in the housing market in 2008? If you owned a home, you know you got blasted. How People just lost money like crazy. Here in Tallahassee, property values dropped by like 20%. Other parts of Florida, it was closer to 50%. Maybe some places even more, I don't know. But people were losing their shirts. So that's 2008. 2009, we start having this conversation. Hey, let's spend $3.5 million on a building. How do you think that conversation went for a lot of our people? Not very well. So we had some people in our world, and they just, they, they loved our church, but they were really pushing back on this. And so we had people sort of on both ends of this spectrum who were really excited about it, others who were very conservative about it. And it's a whole other story of how God worked in that whole situation and led our church to be united as we move forward, because that's where we end up. We wind up moving forward in a united way, and it's been a wonderful thing. It was great for our church to walk that road. But early on, there were some kind of people who were very divided over it. So one day, I get a phone call from the husband and wife from this couple, and they say, we really want to talk to you. It's important, and we want it to be, you know, very isolated and all this. And so they show up, and, you know, they want to meet at like 7 o'clock at night. It's really kind of a late meeting. And I agree. And they come to my office, and you all, for the next hour... They told me everything that was wrong with me. I mean, they ripped me up. And they said, and because your leadership is so terrible, we're going to leave this church. I mean, they lit me up. After they lit me up, I, I can, that's fine, it's okay, so whatever. After they lit me up, though, then they lit in on church leadership. They were naming deacons by name, group leaders by name, committee members by name. I mean, just person after person after person, just shredding these people, y'all, that I love, that I care about. And these are my church family, okay? And then she says to me, the lady says to me, this church doesn't, I don't support this building project because this church doesn't deserve a new building. I was like, oh. I'm thinking, man, I don't know that I've ever been more thoroughly judged in my entire life. Have you ever been there? Ever been judged before? Ever been in a situation where you felt like people were just condemning you? If I were to tell that story to somebody outside the church, there are a lot of people who would say, figures. It was inside the church. That's what the church is. The church is way too judgmental. And it might be that you're here today, and you were brought here against your will, okay? And you're thinking, yep, I don't ever want to be a part of a church because church is way too judgmental. That's my number one beef with the church. And certainly that is the reputation of the church, isn't it? 
that the church is just way too judgmental. But is that true? Is the church way too judgmental? I just think about that for a second. See, here's what I would say. I would push back on that a little bit. I would say this. I don't think that the problem with the church is that the church is too judgmental. I think the problem in the church is that it applies judgment in ways that harm instead of ways that help. I think the church can be prone to being real judgy with people who are outside the church. But we don't hold ourselves, meaning those of us inside the church, we don't hold ourselves to our own standards. I think we do a a really lousy job judging ourselves. And this makes a mess. And it makes a mess for two reasons. First, it wrecks the reputation of the church by making us look both judgmental and hypocritical because we don't practice what we preach, right? So it makes us look both judgy and hypocritical, trashes our reputation. And then the other thing that happens here is that it wrecks our unity, which is what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks. It completely wrecks our unity because when we fail to hold one another accountable, we allow the church to just get torpedoed by all kinds of sin issues. And when when you get torpedoed by sin issues, the result of that is going to be destroyed relationships. And so the church just kind of crumbles because we don't have the resolve to say, friend, I love you and I can't let you do that to yourself. And so because we never take that stand, we just sort of let the church fall apart from the inside out rather than confront a problem. So I would argue, hey, the church is not too judgmental. The church does not apply its judgment well. It doesn't apply its judgment wisely. And I would say to you, I get it. This is really hard to do. One of the reasons it's tough to do is the makeup of the church. We've been talking about this the last couple of weeks. The church, we said, is a body, and it's a unified body, but it's not a uniform body. So the church comes together, and we're from all these different backgrounds and all these different walks of life and everything, and we're all unique and we're all different. But we gather around and we say, okay, we're going to come together, form a body and be unified. And last week we said we're going to be unified by something called the gospel. We said the gospel is the glue that holds us together. And that's the choice we make. We're going to unite around this thing called the gospel. And last week we defined the gospel this way. Take a look at it. We said that the gospel is God's plan to achieve forgiveness for our sin, not by our own efforts, but as a gift we accept so we can be united with God. Take a look at the last little part of that verse, how it ends. The whole goal, the outcome of the gospel is so that we can be united with God. I love that idea. So here's the thinking that in the church, the church is unified around the gospel and the gospel is all about uniting us with God. And so we come together as a people who've been united with God and we unite with one another around this idea, the idea of the gospel. Now, think about this with me for a moment, if you would. If we are in a new relationship with God, if we're united with him, okay, Who in that relationship gets to define the terms? Who gets to decide what's right, what's wrong? Does God get to or do I get to? God decides what is right and what is wrong. What do I get to decide? I get to decide if I'm going to obey or disobey. That's what I get to decide. So I'm in this relationship with God. God decides what is right and wrong. The gospel is what brings me into that relationship. The church is glued together by the gospel. That's where we find our unity. And when we come into a relationship with God through the gospel, we learn through the gospel what is right, what is wrong, and that's what holds us together. It's our code of conduct. Okay? Take a look at it. This is how the Bible puts this in the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 17. For for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. So when we come together, when we're united with God through the gospel, we begin to learn what he says is right and what he says is wrong. And the church rallies around this, is glued together by this. And we agree as a body, and this is key for today, that the gospel is the guide. 
So we're all diverse. We come from all these different backgrounds. We got all these different kind of different experiences. But we come together through the gospel. We are in a relationship with God. Because we're in a relationship with God, we agree that God gets to decide what is right and what is wrong. And the gospel then becomes our guide. Living the gospel is what glues us together. And to that end, then, the church needs to lovingly extend to one another good judgment, good discernment, and the church should hold each other accountable. Now, as I say that, some of you all might be thinking this. You might be thinking, David, that is your job. That is what we pay you for. We pay you and Doug and Tommy and Warren and Aaron and Scott to be our hired guns, okay? It's your job to hold church members accountable. That's not my job. Now, as a staff member here, as a pastor here, we do have a lot of challenging conversations with people. That's a part of what we do. I get it. But is that just our job? Or is it the church family's job? I would submit it's all our responsibility. If the gospel is going to be the glue that holds us together, if the gospel is going to be the guide, then I've got a responsibility to look at my brother or sister in Christ, and if I see them doing something that's just outright dangerous, go to them and say, friend, I love you too much. Let's have a conversation, right? You got it? Now, this is a challenge in the church because, man, we're all concerned. I don't want somebody to think that I'm, I'm better than they are. I think that I'm better than they are. I don't want this person to hate me if I have this. You know, we, we just, we're very reluctant to get into this space. And that resistance is not a new thing. It's a, been a part of church life from the very, very beginning. And it was a big deal in the church in Corinth because this church, as we've told you before, this church is in a very diverse city, the city of Corinth. And it's like New Orleans or something, okay? So there's people from all walks of life, all kinds of crazy things happening. And it was very easy for the church in that position to look outside of itself and say, oh, I'm going to judge what's happening over there and what's happening over there and what's happening over there. And to look right beyond the boundaries, if you will, of the church and judge everything around them, but never take a look at what was happening in themselves. And you all... That mistake was absolutely wrecking the church. So what happens in 1 Corinthians chapters 5 and 6 is Paul's going to show us some examples of how this church is getting it wrong. And then he's going to say, and this is what you should be doing. Okay, you ready? Okay, because this is just exciting stuff here. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 1. I can, this is Paul speaking, I can hardly believe the report about the sexual immorality going on among you. Something that even pagans don't do. I'm told that a man in your church is living in sin with his stepmother. You are so proud of yourselves. What? Okay, this is just ugly stuff. This is just gross. I mean, it's just, oh, okay, yuck. So what's going on is there's a guy in the church. He's a part of the church. He's involved in an illicit relationship with his mother-in-law. Now, I want you to just think about this. Can you imagine the destruction that this kind of a sin, this kind of a terrible thing would wreak on a family? What do you think is going on in the mind of the dad, of the father, of the husband? What do you think is the impact on him? What do you think the impact is on other kids or other members of the family? What do you think the impact is on them? I mean, it is just amazing to me to stop and think about the heartbreak, the animosity, the bitterness that this would have brought up. Now, fast forward to today, and I've just got to tell you, when sexual sin enters into a Christian's family, into a Christian family there is no limit to the damage that it can do. And if you decide to go down that road, let me tell you, it's going to wreck everybody. I've, I've just had the chance to sit and speak to families who've been blown apart in this way. And I'm just telling you, there's loads of baggage. There's loads of heartache. This is not a good thing because it's going to leave a mess everywhere it goes. It's going to wreck the kids. It's going to wreck your brothers and sisters. It's going to wreck your parents. It does a number on everybody. So 
back to Corinth. This was going on inside the church. And you know it's ripping apart the family. You know it's doing all kinds of damage. And not only was it doing damage to that family, but this had become the fodder for all kinds of gossip. Can you imagine? Think there'd be a little bit of gossiping going on? How bad had the gossip gotten? The gossip had gotten so bad that Paul, who doesn't live in the city of Corinth, had heard about it. How do you hear about something like that without Instagram, Snapchat? No, I mean, nothing. Okay, this goes old school manual, and it winds up washing up on Paul's beach. He hears about it. If he's heard about it, everybody's heard about it. So this thing is doing all kinds of damage. And what's going on in the church? If you look at verse 2, they're proud of this. What, I, what does that mean? It means that the church was sitting there going, man, we are such a judgment-free zone here at First Baptist Church of Corinth. I mean, we just tolerate and we, we just love. Come on in. We don't care if that's the kind of way that you're wanting to behave. We accept you. And Paul says, what is the matter with you? Now, you guys are actually proud of this thing? No one cares enough about this individual to not go to them and say, hey, hey, what you're doing is going to blow yourself up. Okay. Now, what should have been going on in the church? What should have been happening? Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2, second part of the verse. But you should be mourning in sorrow and shame. So instead of being proud of it, instead of celebrating it, you should be in mourning and sorrow and shame, and you should remove this man from your fellowship. Drop on down to the, to the last part of verse 5. You must throw this man out and hand him over to Satan so that his sinful nature will be destroyed and he himself will be saved on the day the Lord returns. Wow. Does that sound judgmental to you? Yeah. Is it the right thing to do? Yeah. It is. Paul's saying, listen, there's no way that you can let this just go on. You've got to hold him accountable for it. So instead of celebrating this nonsense, confront this guy. And so he's saying, church, you should go to this person and you, say, you should say, listen, if this is the way that you're going to live, if this is the way that you're going to behave, then we really can't relate to you like someone who's a part of the church because the gospel is the glue that holds us together. And so our relationship with God has changed. Our relationship with one another has changed. And you're not following along with that at all. Instead, you're behaving like a non-believer. And so we're going to treat you like a non-believer who is in eternal peril because that's what you are. And we're going to witness to you, and we're going to share the gospel to you, just like we would a non-believer. But we're not just going to paste over this thing and pretend that everything is just okay. Now bring this into our own modern context. And what he's saying is, listen, if you've got a friend who is a part of the church, and they begin to live like this, and they begin to say, hey, this is a good thing, this is, this is right for me to do, Everything about your relationship with that person is effectively changed at that moment. Imagine that guy calls you up and he says, hey, let's go fishing this weekend. You would have to say, listen, I'm going to be candid with you. There's no way that we can go fishing and it's just business as usual. There's no way that we can go fishing and while we're fishing, we're just talking about knolls versus gators. We can't have that kind of conversation. We can't do that because the stakes are too high and I care too much about you. I've got to talk with you about what's really going on. Because what you're doing is going to blow yourself up. It's going to make a mess out of everything going on. I talk to church members all the time and they know somebody else, another Christian, and their marriage is in crisis, and there's infidelity going on, and they say to me, hey, listen, I can't have that conversation with them because if I do, it's going to wreck my friendship with them. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Too late for that. Once this thing gets rooted into their life, it's going to blow up every relationship they have. you got to go to them and tell them, man, your house is on fire. That's what Paul says to do. And that's just one example of a problem they have. Chapter 6 gives us a whole other problem. Take a look at it. Chapter 6, verse 1. 
When one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Then drop on down to verse 3. You should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have a legal dispute about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? I'm saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who is wise enough to decide these issues? Then in verse 6, instead, one believer sues another right in front of unbelievers. Even to have such lawsuits with one another is a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the one who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. Okay, so what's going on here? Inside the church, there are these two church members, and they have what is effectively a small claims court dispute. How many of y'all have ever seen any of the daytime reality courtroom TV shows? Uh, it, the people's court, is that still a thing? Or am I just showing how old I am? Okay. You know, you remember Doug Llewellyn at the end? You know, don't take the law into your own hands. You just take them to court. Remember that? Those of y'all who are old enough. Is that kind of stuff still going on on TV? Okay, y'all have seen this before, right? And it's always small claims kind of stuff. It was like, your honor, the neighbor backed over my fence with a pickup truck and did $800 worth of damage and he won't pay for it. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's that kind of stuff. So that's what's going on in the church. Now, here's the deal. Because the church was so messed up, because there was such a lack of wisdom and discernment in the church, the offended party had no choice but to leave the church, go to a secular court, and go there to look for, God, for justice. He couldn't just come to the church and say, hey, church, this other church member backed over my fence. Do you think that we could come together and help him understand that he should do the right thing? And that God determines what is right and wrong. And that because he's damaged my property, maybe he should be good for it. Don't you think that we can kind of come around that and, and encourage him to do the right thing? The answer was no. And so because of that, if you were going to defraud your neighbor inside the church, it was absolutely open season. You look at that and go, that can't be right. And you're right. You know what was going on? The gospel was not their guide. They were providing no accountability so one church member would uh, go to another church member and say, hey, you need to turn this around. That would never occur. It needs to happen. That would never happen. It would never happen. And I get it. It's hard to sit around and talk with somebody and have a conversation with them about their sin. It's hard to do. As a pastor, it's something I get to do fairly often. It's not easy to do. But the church here was just turning a blind eye. So it's not confronting it when its church members are in all kinds of sin. It's not being there to help bring about a sense of justice. It's applying no wisdom. It's applying no judgment at all. And these were just two examples of how this church in Corinth was getting it wrong. At the end of chapter 6, Paul gives us this kind of punch list of all the other ways the church was messing this up too. And you all, this is one of the most inflammatory pieces of Scripture in the whole Bible. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves or greedy people or drunkards or are abusive or cheat people, none of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, here's what happens so often with these two verses. So often, people will take these two verses and they will apply them to people outside the church. And they'll apply it in such a way that it's a checklist. And so they'll hold that checklist up to non-believers and they'll say, well, are you guilty of these things? If you check yes on any of these boxes, it's off with your head. There's no hope for you. Hmm. Huh. Is that what the passage is about? No. The passage is not written to the unchurched. The passage is written to the churched. And what Paul is saying here is that he's saying, listen, church, you need to understand that we are a body unified, glued together by the gospel. The gospel is our guide. And when you have people inside the church who are rejecting the gospel as their guide, they're living all kinds of ways, but they're not living the gospel when you see that going on, you have to stop and ask, is that person actually born again? Has that person actually received 
the gospel. And we've got to take that seriously. We've got to make sure that they understand that the gospel must be their guide. And you need to confront people who are making those kinds of choices. You just can't let it go. But that's not how the church was handling things. They were just looking the other way. Anything goes. So what Paul is doing is saying, hey, listen, I want you to look deep inside. I want you to ask the question, are you really born again? Because this is the kind of stuff that's happening, and you're headed for judgment, not for redemption. And in all of these circumstances, the church was supposed to unite around the gospel. It was supposed to be a body that came together and said, hey, we're going to lean on the gospel as our guide. We're in a special relationship with God. We're united with him, and we should be living in a way that reflects that. And we should be helping one another live out the gospel because it's really hard to do. And you need people around you who are pulling for you. And you need people around you who are going to encourage you. And you need people around you who are going to tell you the truth. So the problem I would submit, going all the way back to the beginning of our time together, the problem is not that the church is too judgmental. The problem is that we in the church don't judge rightly. We don't bring wisdom and insight and judgment to one another. And we will watch people burn their house to the ground and not say a word. But we'll look beyond the church. We'll look at our culture, and we will light it up on social media. And we'll talk about all the ways that it gets it wrong, and we'll hammer out there. But we won't do anything about what's happening right under our noses. And Paul addresses this. He says, that is upside down. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, uh, 12. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it is certainly your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but as the scriptures say, you must remove the evil person from among you. So Paul says, listen, the church is failing to apply judgment appropriately inside the church, and it's being way too quick to judge those on the outside outside of the church. Now, in other words, we're, just, we're okay if saved people want to act like lost people, but we expect lost people to act like saved people. Paul says, man, that is absolute nonsense. It's upside down. And when we do that, what do you think people who are outside the church are going to think of the church? They're going to look at the church and say, that church is judgmental. That church is hypocritical. Okay? Now, hopefully right now you're thinking, all right, I've heard all this. What in the world do I do with all of this stuff? Okay, what's my part in this? Okay, give me a couple of ideas, things that you can put into place this week. All right, first, if it is in your nature, if you're the kind of person who is judgmental toward those outside the church, give that up. Just give that up, okay? Okay. It doesn't make sense to expect a non-believer to behave like a believer. It doesn't make any sense. So in your, in your workplace and you're around folks who are far from God and they're doing things that people who are far from God do, extend grace and mercy. You know, don't be judging on them. Don't be hating on them. If you've got a coworker and they're just wrecking their marriage, it's a fair thing to come alongside them and say, you know, I've just learned that if I follow biblical principles in my marriage, it sure takes me an awful long way. You know, and I'd love to talk with you about that sometime because I know it's hard. It's hard. Just come alongside that person and point them toward the goodness of Christ. Point them toward the goodness of God. But don't be judging on them, okay? I heard a preacher one time, and this is real old school, you know. How many of y'all ever been in like an old country church where everything rhymed and all that good stuff? You ever been there? I heard a preacher one time, and he put it this way, judge the believing, not the heathen, okay? <laughs> that's actually really good work, isn't it? And if that's in your nature, if judging the heathen is just kind of where you are, just let that go, okay? Let that go. Just make it your goal. I'm not going to go there anymore, all right? That's thing one. Thing two is this. Make the decision to engage in biblically healthy conversations with other people in the body. 
When you see somebody in the body of Christ and they are really struggling, I mean, they are messing with something you all, it will burn their house to the ground. You better say something to them. Don't let that go because the stakes are sky high. A lot of years ago, I was on staff at a church in another city. And um, it's a big church. It's easy not to know everybody. And an appointment shows up on my calendar. I don't know the person. This woman comes in to my office. Very pretty, very striking woman in her 30s. And she says to me, she said, I've been married for a number of years. And my husband is a good, decent, and honorable man. And I know he loves me. But I'm going to be honest with you. He's boring. And I've met this guy at the gym. And he's not boring. He's exciting. And I have decided that I want to leave my boring husband and go and be with this exciting guy at the gym. And I just wanted to kind of do a little checkup and make sure that, you know, the church would be okay with that. I appreciate the fact that she asked, right? I, you know. So I looked at her. And, you know, I, I looked at her and I said, here's what you do. I want you to go home today. And I want you to tell your husband to have a seat on the couch, that you've got something that you need to talk to him about. Have him sit on the couch. And I want you to just get on your knees in front of him, and I want you just to lay your head in his lap. And I want you to say this to your husband. I want you to say, I've been careless with my heart, and I've allowed my attachments to become to another person, and what I have done is wrong. I have sinned against you, I've sinned against God, and I've sinned against my family, and I'm asking you to forgive me. she looked at me like, you want me to do what? And I said, I'm not kidding. What you're doing is evil. And what you're doing will blow your family to pieces. There'll be no recovery. So you go home and you do this. Now, I did not know her husband. I'd never seen her before. I'd never seen him before. Next Sunday, we're at church. It's a large church, huge, massive foyer area. And I'm out in the foyer in between one of the services. And I see this guy. He's making a beeline right for me. And I'm looking at him, and I don't know this guy, but I'm thinking to myself as he's walking toward me, I'm thinking, that looks like a boring husband to me. <laughs> and he comes over to me. And he tears in his eyes. And he just says, thank you. He said, I knew something was wrong. I just didn't know what. And you all, you owe it. You owe it to your brothers and sisters in Christ. That if you see one of them and they're burning their house to the ground, you owe it to them to say, this is wrong. You say, David, I don't want to be judgmental. We need a little more judgment sometimes. And it needs to be properly applied. It needs to be done in love. It needs to be done caringly. It needs to be done with compassion. But you all don't fool yourselves. It needs to be done. Because the payoff is massive. The payoff is huge. Look at what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Some of you were once like that, but you were united around the gospel, and the gospel became the glue, and the gospel became the guide, and you were cleansed, and you were made holy, and you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you. We thank you for caring about us caring about us too much to leave us where we are. And we know, Lord, that there's nothing more transformational than the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we also know that, that frankly, sin, wickedness, evil, it just chases us down. And it's easy for us 
to stumble, to fall. And sometimes the fall is great. And so, Lord, help us to be the church of Jesus Christ. Help us to be united, not uniform. Help us to be glued together by the gospel. Help us to live by the gospel. The gospel is our guide. And help us to apply real judgment, not judging those outside the church, but bringing insight and wisdom and discernment to the body. Father, there are people in this room right now who know of a specific conversation they need to have. Grant them the courage and the wisdom to have the conversation and to have it well. We love you, Lord. We pray this in the great name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we all agreed and said, amen.